Okay, so before we get started, this is what the figure should have looked like. I, I accidentally pasted the same figure into two slides in a row. So this is what I wanted you to see last time. Um, and I don't want to spend too much time on it. The point is just um, that, the, um, that the slope of the BLP, or the breeding value, whatever you want to call it, depends on the allele frequency. So what we're doing here is we're increasing the frequency of the plus allele from 0.5 to 0.95. And as we increase it, um, the best fitting line is much, much closer to these points because virtually everybody is heterozygous or homozygous for the plus alleles. And the fact that this is a large difference um, 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 is, um, uh, you know, doesn't care too much, matter too much when we're trying to minimize the sort of squared deviation because, the, because there are so few people who are homozygous for the zero. So that's, that's all I wanted to convey. Um, okay, um, fine. So now we're going to talk, so move on to sort of more uh, estimating heritability. So this is where we left off. Um, and it's going to turn, so, so we'll, we'll continue to use the same causal model as before, though I'm going to simplify things a little bit by dropping the, the covariates. And the very first thing we're going to do is just standardize everything. So we're just going to standardize by dividing all the variables through by the population standard deviation of, of um, of y tilde, or outcome, okay? Um, and what that, does, what that does is allow us to write the, the, um, um, the model like this. So you have some y, um, and the y um, is determined by a g and a u. And this is a convenient parameterization, because you'll remember that the, the defined heritability is the fraction of variance, the variance of g over the variance of y tilde, um, normalizing like this ensures that the variance of y is 1. So that's going to just help a lot with them. Um, we don't have to worry about the distinction between correlations and covariances, for example, in a lot of case, cases. Okay? But it's, pu it's, it's purely for convenience. Okay. So now suppose that we have some legitimate reasons for trying to, for wanting to estimate this parameter. Um, and the problem, of course, is you know, in the pre molecular era, um, the, the fundamental problem is that we only observe y. <laughs> so you couldn't observe any of the stuff on the right-hand side of the equation. Now we're starting to observe some of the, some of the things that enter into the g. But even there, um, it's, um, um, it's tricky. Um, and so for a very long time, a lot of genetic, behavioral genetics research was really confined to trying to infer the variance of y by looking at how similar different types of relatives are on this variable y. Infer the variance of g. I think I said, I think I said y by accident. OK, so inferring the variance of y is not hard, because y is observable. You draw a sample and you calculate the variance. The problem is the variance of g. So how do we do this? Well, the basic idea is that we're going to measure the phenotypic resemblance of pairs of relatives who differ in terms of how environmentally related, like in terms of their environmental relatedness and the genetic relatedness. And we can only do this under some maintained assumptions. In some cases, those assumptions are very strong, and I'll sort of give some, um, give some examples. And so I'll start by doing it in a sort of fairly general framework that's just supposed to make the point that, that estimating um, heritability has nothing fundamentally to do, nothing to do with twins, really. Heritability is a feature of a population, and so we use twins because they're sort of convenient natural experiment in a lot of cases. <laughs> Um, but we don't, you know, we don't care particularly about, um, you know, the heritability and the subsample of twins in the population or something like that. We're just using them as a convenience, okay? Um, and, and in principle, you could use all kinds of other pairings of relatives, you know? Um, you could use anything you want. It's just a question of whether you're, you're willing to tolerate the assumptions that you have to make. Okay. Now, before we turn to that, let me just show you the sort of the... Um, um, I, Can you clarify Yeah, so I'm actually going to give several examples of like non-twin um, pairings of relatives. So if it's okay, I'll just suspend answering it for two minutes, and then we'll, we'll look, talk about it in detail. Um, it's a very good question, and, um, 
And so what I'm showing you here, just to set the stage, and we're going to get back to these data a little bit later, what I'm showing you here is the phenotypic correlation for five different outcomes for a very, very large sample of um, Swedish men born between 1950 and 1980. And it's restricted to men mostly because a lot of the four out of five phenotypes are from conscription records, so they're measured at 18, and so, um, so those are the data we have. And what's nice about Sweden, so this is virtually all men born before 1950 and 1980 who had at least one brother born within, within five years of their um, year of birth. Okay? So um, huh, if it weren't for the fact that I managed to get out of the military service, I would have been in this data set because I'm born in 81. Okay. So, but um, I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm the rare exception. Like, the coverage is very, very good. So, um, so we have measures of height, BMI, cognitive test score, and the military psychologist's assessment of your ability to deal with wartime stress. Um, and we also have years of schooling. And we have it, importantly, for a bunch of different pairings of brothers. So we have it for monozygotic twins. We have it for dizygotic twins. Then we have it for full siblings reared together. Full siblings reared apart, meaning full siblings, of course, are people who have the same biological parents. Half siblings together, half siblings apart, um, and adoptees. Okay, so how do we know if somebody was raised with their sibling or not? We look in the, um, um, in the censuses. So the censuses take place every five years. And um, if, um, if two people are full siblings, so like according to the government reg records, they have the same mother and the same biological father, um, but they never lived in the same... Um, Apartments in any of the censuses, we say that they're reared apart, and otherwise we say that they're reared together. And if it's not clear, we just discard them. But it's very, very rare. Um, we can similarly identify adoptees, and we can do the same thing for for half sibs. And as you see, um, I mean, there are a couple of points that we'll dig into deeper. But the main, that one thing that I think is striking here is that as a kind of as the genetic relatedness of the sibling types. Decays, you see a decay in phenotypic resemblance. So that's the basic thing that we're going to try to exploit. But the worry is, you know, it could be confounded with environmental resemblance. So maybe monozygotic twins are a lot more similar on these traits than adoptees, partly because of some um, environmental confounding. And, uh, you know, that's a legitimate concern. It's not one that one can definitively rule out. But we try to sort of get at it by, um, by um, uh, also including siblings who vary in terms of, um, in terms of the, uh, whether they were raised in the same household or not. And of course, um, um, the fact that they were raised in the same um, household or in separate households you know, doesn't mean, it, 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 just, it allows us to make a stronger argument, like a stronger, probably just stronger justification for some of the assumptions that we're going to make. So let's, let's look at some examples and get back to this um, question. Okay, so before we do that, so the, the general idea is you know, there are these different types of pairings of relatives, you know, type. Um, so M MZ twins reared together, full half siblings reared apart, adoptees, etc. Um, and what we're going to do is typically, so like in the population, there's going to be some covariance. We're going to use a prime for one of the siblings. So just arbitrarily call one of them sibling one and sibling two. And sibling two gets a prime to so just um, make the distinction. Um, and then we can calculate the covariance between Y and Y prime for some particular pairing a relative. So there's going to be some population covariance, which is also um, probably going to be a correlation. And that covariance is going to be the sum of three terms, um, uh, potentially. So it's going to, be, going to depend on the covariance of their Gs, the covariance of their Us, and possibly a covariance term between G and U, depending on um, um, uh, the model you have in mind. Okay. And now, so if relatives of type K are broadly representative of the population as a whole, so by that I mean that the distribution of Gs and the distribution of Us in, um, in, the, um, 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 you know, in that subsample, so just to make matters concrete, suppose we have uh, you know, identical twins, if their phenotypic distributions are the same, and we have no reason to think that the distribution of genotypes and Us are different, then... Um, um, you know, we can rewrite it like this, and I think it's kind of useful for understanding the sort of um, 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 uh, the approach that we're going to be relying on to explain where these BG estimates come from. So the phenotypic correlation is going to, you, turns out we can write it 
you know, if the, if the variances and other, of, of MZ twins say are the same, we can rewrite it as a, as a correlation between the genotypes of um, relatives of type K times the broad heritability. The correlation of their environments times u, u squared plus twice a covariance term. And the fundamental, like the basic idea of behavior genetic research is that we can use genetic theory, potentially, we have to make some assumptions to justify, you know, come up with some value of what this parameter should be. Um, in the case of identical twins, it's not very hard, but in the case of half sibs, maybe it's a little um, trickier, so we might have to assume things like additivity, and you know, we have to make some strong assumptions, but the purpose of today's lecture is in part to kind of be very explicit about those, because every time you estimate an ACE model, or um, um, almost every time you're implicitly making those assumptions. So, we, so we're going to use genetic theory to justify the choice of, of or, or, or some other information. So for example, knowing that two people were adopted into the same household and that they have share no biological parents, you know, maybe that's a reasonable um, um, grounds for arguing that you know, rho g for adoptees should be a very low number. Um, though, of course, we have no reason to, there's no reason to think that it's going to be exactly zero. And we'll talk about reasons why, you know, may not be zero in the case of, of adoptees. We'll, we'll go through a like, couple of sib siblings, um, um, types of siblings. And similarly, we're going to try to use information about whether individuals were reared in the same household or not to make to, like, impose some restrictions of this rho KU, so the covariance of the environmental term. Uh, U squared, I should say, is just the variance of U. Um, okay. That's the basic idea. So let's go through a couple of examples. So let's start with MZ twins reared apart. And in each case, I'm going to kind of um, sketch a thought experiment. And that's sort of, you should think of it as the, as the um, ideal experiment that we're trying to approximate um, with our research design. Okay? Um, and so, um, so, so here the thought experiment is you know, we have a large representative sample of twins, and by representative I mean that they sort of look like singletons, which is the, really the population that we're trying to generalize to. And we assume that they're randomly separated at birth and then just assigned to households at random. Um, and we also, you know, okay, so that's the basic, that's, that, that's the, that would be like the, um, the ideal uh, quasi-experiment. Um, of course, in practice, um, in practice, we have to um, rely on something highly imperfect, but it's useful to kind of have that ideal in mind, I think, when we think about possible violations and so issues with the assumptions that we're going to make. Okay. So if assignment is random, it's not unreasonable. In fact, <laughs> it follows that their environment should be uncorrelated and this covariance term should drop out. Okay. In practice, right? Even with twins reared apart, there are all kinds of reasons to think that there's some selectivity in placement. Um, there's no reason to think that they were separated exactly at birth. There's no reason to think that they were randomly assigned to households. And there's no reason to think that their prenatal conditions were exactly identical, or like somehow, you know, that we some kind of can hold them constant. Um, nor is there any reason to think that they're exactly representative of the population as a whole. But um, it's not a... Um, um, you know, my view at least is that it's a very useful source of data. Um, and I think I just listed all the like, obvious um, potential violations that I could think of. So if anyone else has more, please um, bring them up. Um, that's sort of what I'm hoping what we'll do in the next couple of slides. So what have I forgotten? Okay, so, so, maybe, so, so maybe those are the main potential issues. Okay, so since they're monozygotic, I think we do very little harm in setting this... Um, um, genetic covariance parameter to one, and then, then we're left with a moment condition that the, that in a sample of monozygotic twins reared apart, the correlation should be equal to the um, broad heritability. Right. So that just comes from. That just comes from this. We said this is zero because of random assignment. This is zero. And this, we can rewrite like this. And rho mz of g is you know, approximately equal to 1. Um, like there's no reason to think that, that, that this number is a, 
um, anything but extremely close to one. Okay. So, so that's our moment condition. And then, you know, ideally, the ideal research design would be to go out and draw a random sample of these uh, twins who are randomly assigned at birth. We calculate the sample analog of this population parameter. So call that like rho hat mza. And that's going to be a, a consistent estimator of broad uh, heritability. So notice that with, these, with this kind of research design, um, you're not going to be able to separately identify the additive effect um, and the non-additive effect. Unless you, know, unless you just rule out non-additive effects by assumption, which is often what's done. I think when, and sometimes that may be justified, but I think it's important to understand that you're making an assumption, and if the assumption is, um, is, um, uh, is wrong, not just in a, like it's quant wrong in a quantitatively meaningful sense, you're going to get biased estimates. Okay, so that's uh, monozygotic twins reared apart. Questions about that? Okay, so then our next thought experiment, so we're going to do exactly the same thing for fuller half siblings. Okay? So the thought experiment is the same, but now we do it with full siblings or half siblings. And again, there are, like, the actual data don't perfectly um, 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 conform to these, like, ideal conditions, but it's useful to, to just still spell out what the ideal conditions are, because then we can think more clearly about what, what violations we might worry about. Okay, so if we have random assignment, then the environmental correlations are going to be zero, so is this covariance term. However, a difference now between the full and half siblings reared apart and the, and the monozygotic twins is that it's a lot harder to pin down these, um, uh, oh, this would be G, so the genetic correlations, um, without some strong assumptions about um, um, the, um, the amount of, um, uh, uh, the, the proportion of the uh, broad heritability that's, um, that's due to the additive um, component. So what we'll do is we'll proceed by assuming um, that broad heritability is just um, narrow heritability plus a dominance component. So in other words, we're ruling out interactions between, between A and D, and we're ruling out interactions between um, low side. We're ruling out epistasis. And we're assuming that the population is in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. And then it turns out you can sort of get a closed form um, Solution, um, and um, I think at least I think one of these you derived on the problem set, if I'm not mistaken. So, but but the Hardy-Weinberg assumption is quite important for the derivation. Um, okay, so what does that mean? So so so, so we're we're comfortable assuming, um, comfortable assuming. Um, so, so suppose we're comfortable assuming these things, and of course, in practice, it's going to be phenotype specific. Um, it may be that you're more worried about violations due to failure of um, random mating for some traits than others. I think um, in two weeks, um, you will have seen a lot of evidence that there's substantial sort of mating for education. So for example, like applying these kinds of models to education is probably going to give you, um, create problems that you know, could be quantitatively important or worth exploring somehow. Um, but okay, we're going to, for the purpose of illustration, we'll sort of proceed under this assumption. And notice now that if you were, if you like, if, again, if you went out, you drew a sample of, of, of these full siblings reared apart at random, and you calculated the sample correlation, what you have is something that consistently estimates one half of H2A and one quarter of the dominance variance. Okay. So if you just had the M MZ twins, um, read apart, you can just get an estimate of broad heritability under the best of conditions. If you just have the um, full sibs read apart and under the maintained assumption that, you know, that, this, that this condition holds, then you can get something that's a mix of the dominance variance and, um, um, and the additive variance. And so maybe some of you can see where we're going to go with this. It's going to turn out that you can, it's often going to be helpful to combine the two. Um, okay, and for half sibs, we get like we get an analogous expression that I guess didn't make it onto the it got cut off. Um, but the key thing about that expression is that the resemblance on the dominance sort of decays more rapidly. 
Yeah, and so that's important because um, otherwise you wouldn't get any um, improved additional identification from the from the half sib. So the half sibs wouldn't allow you to actually identify additional parameters, estimate a richer model. And um, yeah, well, I mean, it's actually going to be on a slide. Um, um, so for those of you who read the Goldberger paper, this is what he calls the design matrix. So if I'm not mistaken, James will fact check me. So for FSA, why we have this? Oh, what do we call it? H square? Sorry, I'm used to different notation. And for half siblings reared apart, it's a quarter H square of A plus, I believe, a sixteenth. Okay, H square D. And my physics teacher in high school told me that my handwriting would get me into trouble one day. Okay, but the point, the, I mean, the important point here is that um, there's not a perfect collinearity problem here. So, like, in principle, at least, this gives you some identif like additional identification if you're you know, willing to live with the assumptions we're making. Okay, and then we'll just do a third one, which is adoptees. And notice I'm purposefully, and now I want to get back to your question, I'm purposefully avoiding um, um, twins here just to make the point that there's nothing, you know, fundamentally, like twins are just a useful tool in, in these settings, but they're not, there's nothing in, by, by the methods themselves that force you to use twins, okay? So finally with adoptees, so here the basic idea is going to be that when children are adopted, um, you introduce a lot of independence variation in, the, in their rearing environment and the conditions under which they're raised. And anybody who knows, um, knows the adoption literature will know that, of course, in practice, again, the, you worry about selectivity of placement. There are all kinds, actually, there are a lot of, um, a lot of issues with our, um, there are a lot of implicit assumptions here. And I want to make sure that we talk them through all of them. But, but let's start with the thought experiment again. So the thought experiment is we take some, we kidnap some babies and we randomly assign them to, um, um, to households at birth and then they're raised there. Okay? So if you have two siblings who are raised in the same household but are genetically unrelated, um, and if they were randomly assigned to the households, it stands to reason that there should be no genetic relationship with them and that the covariance term should be um, um, zero as well. So if, if, you take, if you measure some outcome, say BMI at age 18, of a bunch of brother pairs who are genetically unrelated but were raised in the same home, and you observe some relationship, um, then that tells you that something about the... Um, um, about the um, family environment or some factor that sort of varies at the level of the family and that these siblings shared um, made them a little bit more similar on BMI. Um, and in our notation, it turns out just from the just making these assumptions, um, substituting them in here, then we're left with um, um, just this term. This vanishes with a random assignment. And this vanishes because we're assuming that they're genetically unrelated. Um, and um, okay, so now, so now let's. So, 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 so now let me get back to your question as I understood it, and sort of try to clarify what I was trying to say. So I said that it can be useful to look at non-twin twin pairings of relatives, such as adoptees, but of course you have to evaluate, you know, whether or not um, uh, you know the gains outweigh the benefits. So for example, um, in the case of adoptees, like, I think the adoption, I happen to like, think the adoption design is very powerful and interesting. Um, but you do have to worry about, you know, there's no reason to think that this moment condition is more than at best a decent approximation. Um, and there are additional things that crop up here that may not arise um, in the twin comparisons. Twins, with the exception of things like birth weights, tend to be reasonably representative of of the population as a whole. That's not true um, for adoptees in general. Um, so in particular, um, um, you know, not everybody's allowed to adopt. <laughs> so, so there are, um, a, um, the, the, the range of environments to which adopted children are exposed is probably fundamentally different um, from the sort of typical range of environments in the population as a whole. So that's, that's important. That means that it's not innocuous to assume that the distribution of these U's 
in the adoptee population is, um, is similar to the population as a whole. And it's also the case that if you like, uh, you know, the, the reasons why parents give up their children for adoption vary a lot, but sometimes there are like serious health problems that are underlying, um, underlying the decisions. Um, and so, you know, there's no, no, no reason to think that the distribution of genotypes is exactly representative either. Um, so those are some issues. It may also be that just you know, by virtue of being adopted, um, that sort of changes the nature, like dynamics of the parent-child relationship. All of these things are, in principle, things that people have uh, raised um, concerns about. Um, and it turns out, it turns out, and, and of course, there's the problem of selectivity of placements, right? So if we observe that these two brothers that I just described have are somewhat more similar in BMI than two randomly chosen, you know. 18 year olds in the Swedish population. Can we really know that this is because of their family environment? Or could it be that, um, that the process by which adoptees are signed into homes in induces some positive um, correlation? For example, adoption agencies might try to sort of um, match um, children to parents with sort of similar uh, characteristics, say. Or they might use information about the biological parents of the adoptee and try to. To, to assign the child to a household where um, um, that somewhat resemble, where the adoptive parents somewhat resemble the biological parents on dimensions such as education. And there is some, some of that in, in the data in, in, in most studies that I, that I know of. Um, so, so maybe what that means is like once you think, these, think through these problems, maybe you end up concluding, um, um, maybe you end up concluding that the biases push you, like you're comfortable assuming that you're, what you're, what you're going to get is an upper bound or a lower bound, something like this. And, and so it still adds more information. Um, and you know, if you calculate, if you gather data from all these different sibling types and you get a reasonably congruent set of results, then that's quite encouraging, I think. And if not, it tells you something important about you know, where to look for the sources of any violations. OK, so this thing. Most of you will have seen before. You just maybe you don't realize it, and it's just what's called C square with the original, like in the conventional um, ACE decomposition that will that will come to. This is just what 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 you get with our with our notation. Okay, so um, now I want to make sure. I want to make sure I was clear about the main potential issues with um, with. Um, Adoptees. Have I missed anything, or does anybody have questions or comments? Does anybody have any other examples of ways in which the conditions of the ideal thought experiment might be might have been violated? Nobody. Okay. So, um, okay. So suppose suppose that for some reason we care about h squared d and h squared a, not just their sum. And suppose that we were originally going to go out and just gather a sample of mz twins reared apart. And um, that was going to be our research strategy. And then when somebody says to you, well, um, but what about uh, non-additive effects? The answer is, oh, I'll just assume an additive model. Okay, So you know, sometimes that might be reasonable. Uh, but it turns out that you can often do a lot better, right? And in particular, um, you know, the adoption design by in, in and of itself might just give you an estimate of what you guys think of as C square or, or product of these two parameters. Um, the MZ twins reared apart might just give you an estimate of broad heritability, but maybe you can somehow combine the two um, and extract a little bit more information. Um, and people tried doing this, and like my general view is that it's a, it's a um, useful exercise because, um, um, because you know, the more variation you have in genetic relationship and the more variation you have in the, um, in the rearing conditions, um, the more confident you can be that your conclusions aren't very sensitive to specific research design that you um, opted for. Um, and without a doubt, there are, you know, there are some... Um, there are some um, examples of uh, you know, what appear to be systematic differences between research design. So one very common claim that I've encountered in the literature, I've never looked into it in detail, is that 
a lot of adoption studies seem to find larger um, values of this parameter um, than you would get from a twin study, for example. And so um, by, by the end of the lecture, my sort of hope is that um, um, I will have made it a little bit clearer what you sort of, how you think about trying to get to the bottom of what's going on, uh, at least in principle. OK, so, so in principle, you can just jointly analyze the data on phenotypic resemblance of many different types of relatives. That's going to give you additional moment conditions. That's going to allow you to identify um, additional parameters, estimate a richer model. And the Goldberger paper talks about how fundamentally, like, um, I, <laughs> when, um, so those of you who work with twin data will know this already, but there are these canned um, softwares available for estimating twin models, and they're great, and I encourage you to use them, but I also encourage you to sort of reflect a little bit on what exactly we're assuming. Um, and I think that, um, uh, I think it's um, useful um, uh, I think it's useful to sort of think about the more um, general research strategy with more sibling types and what it can buy you. Um, I also think that boiling this down to the very core, <laughs> just the moment conditions, uh, might sort of help demystify a little bit what's going on when you, when you estimate these models. Because fundamentally it's about writing down some theory of how the phenotype is determined. Um, making some assumption about the covariance of these latent variables, um, and then based on those assumptions, backing out, a, um, um, backing out an estimate of the par parameter that you're interested in. Um, and basically having more types of siblings allow you, allows you potentially to, to extract more information. Um, OK, so in practice, nobody would do what I'm proposing here. But like in principle, it would work just like it would work just fine. It would give you nearly the same answer as the um, as uh, you know as your favorite software. So and and if you go back to the seventies, this is more or less what people did. So what is that? Well, they they have a bunch of moment conditions, one for each sibling type. Um, they have some um, sample analog of that moment of that population moment. And then they maximize, minimize some weighted square deviation between the two. And theta here, like, are the parameters in your, um, that you're trying to estimate. So the parameters might be h square a, h square d, and you know, the family uh, environmental effect, something like that. Um, and then because, um, because some of these correlations are going to be estimated, will have been estimated on much larger samples than others, you, like it may, for efficiency reasons, it makes sense to weight a little bit. Um, so, like, so, so assign more weight to the, to the correlations that are more precisely estimated. And fundamentally, this is all you're doing when you're um, estimating a behavior genetic model. Now, I've simplified, a, <laughs> I've simplified a little bit. One thing, in practice, people don't work with these correlations. They work with these Fisher transforms because of their distributional properties. So in practice, this is like, in a practical application, even if you did, this, did it this old-fashioned way, you would use a... Um, like it would be a nonlinear least squares problem, but conceptually, I think presenting it this way, I, you know, I, I help, I found quite I, um, clarifying at least. And Goldberger talks about some of these, some of these um, details. In practice, I doubt that the that the you know, Fisher transformation of the correlation coefficient makes a big difference for the results. But maybe I'm wrong. So let me, rather than talk about it in the abstract, let me give you an example based on the on the four sibling types that we just went through. Um, and basically, what you do is you write down your moment conditions. And you can do it like this. So here, you know, our maintained assumption is that, um, is that um, uh, h squared g, so broad heritability, is the sum of these two terms. Um, and, um, and then there's this family component that only kicks in for the adoptees. And so in this example, you have four moment conditions. You have four independently informative um, um, equations. So it is important that these um, that there's no like that this is full rank. Um, and because we have four independent moment conditions, we have three parameters. We would actually be over identified. Okay. So if we found something funny, like if we found if there's a restriction that we could test the restriction, for example, if the model imposes a makes a prediction, um, and we then we can, you know, we can, we can, you can use the extra degree of freedom to test it. Um, 
And, um, and once you've written that, so this is what Goldberg calls the design matrix. I, once you've written it down like this is very straightforward in principle to just get estimates. You go out, you calculate you know, the empirical analogs of these things, and then you do a weighted least square regression of those sample correlations on these, um, on these three right-hand side variables. That's it. Done. And that's really all that uh, MX or these other softwares um, is doing for you. Like in principle, any model that's MX um, estimates for you can be written like this. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm sure there's some equivalent um, um, path diagram notation that's, you know, that says the same thing in just a different way. Um, and so whatever notation you're used to is fine. I, I, like, I do urge you to sort of sit down whenever you, you work on one of these things and make sure you understand what, um, what assumptions you're making. You don't have to do it this way, uh, or whatever work, way works for you. But is this clear? Am I making does this make sense? Okay. All right. So I haven't said a word about twins. Now let's go to twins. Um, so the problem is, of course, in, in practice, right, you rarely, have, you, know, you rarely have random assignments or something that sort of approximates random assignment. And so you often worry about confounding of genetic and environmental similarity. So the basic idea of a twin study is that MZ and DZ twins are going to differ in their genetic similarity, and we're going to, um, we're going to stick our necks out and make, um, make an assumption about just how much they differ. But they're, if, they're raised, you know, if they're raised together, then by definition they're raised in the same family, and so we can difference out any factors that siblings share, uh, raised in the same family share. Um, that's the idea. Um, and here are the assumptions that like, tend to be made. Now, notice in a Conventional twin study, right? You have effectively have two moments. Um, you have an MZ correlation that you can estimate. You have a DZ correlation, and um, that's really all it is. Um, and there's no um, there's no getting. <laughs> um, that's just the way it is. So so let's let's go through the assumptions that that one is always the, that you're like always implicitly making when when estimating one of these. ACE model. So first is that all the genetic variance is additive. So broad and narrow heritability are the same thing. Um, and then I do want to make sure we take time to go over each one of these. We assume there's no sort of mating at the genetic level. And that, coupled with assumption one, allows us to sort of pin down the genetic covariance of DZ twins. We assume there's no gene environment correlation. Um, and then we assume equal environment. And by far, the um, the assumption that's attracted the most controversy is number four. <laughs> My view is <laughs> that you should be a lot more worried about one, two, and three. <laughs> but uh, uh, it will, I mean, yeah, could, be, could be wrong. It wouldn't be the first time. So we're going to talk, I think, in great detail about all of these things. So Loic is going to give a, an entire lecture on, um, on a sort of mating and how that impacts these sorts of um, um, derivations. Um, and, you know, in principle, you can write down a model where you get a moment condition that takes into account a sort of mating. But probably, in order for it to be identified, you need to you know, add some more um, data, maybe something like spousal phenotypic correlation or something like that is, what, we, is what, what you would need. Or maybe you can use genetic data these days. Alex Young is going to talk about how this assumption is often violated. Um, in the con especially in the context of a social science trait. I think he's going to talk about that, yeah. Um, and, this, and, and, and it turns out, no. in some sense, Young and Loic are kind of bringing these debates from the 70s, um, uh, bringing molecular genetic data to them. Because um, um, back in the 70s, there was a, you know, People estimated these models, but um, there's, there's just so much uncertainty about the, you know, about the underlying processes that there are many ways to um, organize the data, and it was very hard to convincingly distinguish between them. So some people, when they sort of found like, like departures from the simplest of models, they sort of patched them up by making strong, like by allowing for substantial gene environment correlations. So Stanley Jenks was one of them who emphasized 
correlation between genes and environment. And I think Alex, um, Alex Young's work for, for, you know, for things like education has certainly vindicated uh, him. Um, and for sort of amazing, likewise, you know, some people were saying it's all, basically the, the, the issue here is that you know, we really need to know the genetic covariance uh, of this, uh, between the spouses. And so in principle, you might have some phenotypic resemblance, even though there's not much resemblance at the genetic level. So you, you, know, you have to make assumptions in order to sort of take into account the sort of amazing. And now with molecular genetic data, you have an additional resource that in principle you could, you could add to, um, 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 to make a more re realistic assumption about the, um, about the extent to which um, likes attract. Um, okay. What about the equal environment assumption? Um, does anybody, um, like what, what, what is the equal environment assumption? <laughs> so I've stated it here. I'm saying it's about the correlation of these U's, and MZ twins and DZ twins. And we're saying that they're the same. Well, I think that, um, once you, once you interpret heritability the way I prefer to do it, like in the Jenks way, like just definitionally saying that anything that's ultimately caused by your genes um, is um, no. part of the heritable variation, um, then the, um, the only thing left in this U term are the non-genetic um, you know, environmental effects of things that vary exogenously or independently of your, or your genotypes. So, so, once you, so once you add in like, these evocative effects, once you consider them part of the genotype, um, then I'm not too concerned about the equal environment assumptions. So this, that's the way I think about it. So um, I think there's a common um, assumption um, that... Um, if you observe, for example, that you know, monozygotic twins have um, parents who, um, like the parents of monozygotic twins treat them more similarly, um, and then we jump to the conclusion that therefore we must have a violation of the equal environment assumption, the way I think about it, and the way I define heritability in environment, that's not necessarily the case. I mean, there's a first, there's a first issue, which is, it has to be etiologically relevant, right? So, there, um, so, so it's not enough that, that parents treat the MZ twins more similarly if that treatment in, you know, ultimately ends up having you know, uh, no effects on the phenotype. So something silly like um, you know, giving, giving both of your monozygotic boys a pink shirt for their um, birthday or something, that's only a violation insofar as um, it has some downstream effects that makes them more similar, and if you wouldn't have done it, were they DZ twins? Um, and the other thing, I mean, and the other issue is that um, to the extent that the parenting behaviors are more similar because the twins are acting more similarly and therefore evoking more similar responses, you know, I don't think of that as an equal environment violation, assumption violation either. Does that make sense? So this is sort of discussed in the, in the, in the Jenks paper at length, and I think his, um, uh, I think his treatment of it is really, is really quite good. Um, can, can I ask a question? Yeah, please. So, so, um, so if if the reason the parents treat monozygotic twins more similarly is not because they're genetically similar and so they're evoking the you know, parental response, but just because there's like a societal Something like, you know, we think that we should treat monozygotic twins yeah. more similarly because it's cuter. Yeah, yeah, know, yeah. It's just because they're twins. Yeah. Um, would, would that be a, a problem, or do you think that still fits into... No, I think that would be a problem because, like, again, we're, like, we're interested in generalizing to the to singletons, right? And if there's something... Like, if they're being treated more similarly just because they are monozygotic, yeah. <laughs> then I think that's a violation, provided it has some effects, like, provided it actually enters into the you in some meaningful way. Um, now, it's funny you mention this because, <laughs> um, because there, are, like, there are actually examples 
uh, for most of the 20th century, like education psychology subscribes to this view that you should separate monozygotic twins because they won't be able to develop their own identities and these sorts of things. And so, you know, it's possible that to the extent these things operate, they're actually in the opposite direction. You know, of, of a, you know, they're in the direction of um, an equal environment assumption violation that um, I think con like goes in the opposite direction of what most people like, expect. Um, but my view is that just like one to three are really big um, quantitatively important uh, issues here. Yeah? So, would be an issue if, like, the, say, the correlation environment among normal siblings, not non siblings, are different than the correlation environment as a and monozygotic twins? Yeah. So, so, uh, so, so, let me see if I understand what you mean. So, so, are you saying, for example, that maybe parents with twins just purposefully try to make them more similar or something like that? No, or just the twins are they are born the same year, the same time. Sure. And in the way the parents interact with the twin versus two different two siblings can be different. So the environmental effects in general on the twin can be different than for the single twins. That's the correlation that we care. Yeah, so so I mean so if that that were the case, let's think again of like what the ideal experiment would be. So so in principle, those forces shouldn't operate, right, if we're separating them at birth, right? Yeah. So if, well, this was, if we thought this was a big issue, and maybe, like, maybe it is an issue, then um, like the testable implication is that, that studies of twins reared apart should, should show like, substantially lower rates of concordance. That doesn't appear to be the case, though you know, there are all kinds of issues with this, I, you know, studies of twins reared apart, so it's not like that's definitive, but I, I don't... Um, um, I don't know of any evidence that this is like quantitatively important. Okay. Yeah. So maybe others do. Like there are twin researchers in here who like study this stuff for a living, unlike me. So, uh, uh, yeah. yeah. Please. Um, for phenotypes that aren't observed until the twins are out of the household, yeah. is there a concern about making an assumption about a shared environment? So, what's it, so, what, so um, can you spell that out, uh, explain a little bit more what you mean? Like, so for, for educational twins, you know, mm. if we're looking at a phenotype, you know, we wouldn't really observe any data for the twins that aren't in a shared environment or could be out of the shared environment. Oh, I don't think, I mean, I don't think that's the problem. I think it matters for the interpretation. So it's like, as Paige said, there are some striking findings of, um, like, some traits for which they, you see, um, uh, like, C-squared going down substantially uh, as people age. But I think that tells you something about the developmental process. I don't think that's a violation of any like model assumptions or anything like that. You know, there's nothing that says that C square has to be the same for a phenotype measured at 18 and 22. Yeah. Oh, that's a good question. Um, it's actually one of the points Sandy makes. Implicitly, yes, but um, um, you know. With the right assumptions, you could throw in opposite sex twins as well. And there, in that case, it's also, I mean, in principle, some of the assumptions you're making are testable. So if you do see um, that the opposite sex DZ correlation is lower than the same sex DZ correlation, you know, that could be an indication that, uh, you know, maybe it's not exactly the same genes that operate in men and women or something like that. And there are like multivariate um, twin study methods that have been developed to test that very um, hypothesis. So. so. Yeah, that's right. That's right. That's, that's right. That's absolutely right. Yeah. And so, and so precisely, f I, I think, partly for that reason, um, like most studies as, as an empirical matter tend to sort of restrict, restrict the analysis to comparisons of obviously monozygotic twins for the same sex um, to DZ twins for the same sex. Sorry, I mean, could I ask a question? Yeah. I just relate to that. But, um, in terms of the, uh, the reared apart of the monozygotic and the DA twins, the um, I was trying to understand, like, how, how does the environment affect it like prenatal stress? Yeah. Um, I mean, I think I think you could you could look at the literature and you could probably get some like reasonable upper bound on how big it could be. And um, I would be very surprised if an analysis like that showed that it's a major source of resemblance. But it's in like. Uh, I, I have little doubt that those effects exist. I mean, even more so with adoptees. And with twins, you know, there's a special circumstance that they're, you know, they're, they're lower birth weights. Um, um, 
So um, there have been claims, you know, that this is a major source of um, inflation of twins-based heritability estimates. I do not believe those claims. I think that they're exaggerated. And I don't think that they've stood up to subsequent scrutiny and like a replication efforts in larger samples. That doesn't mean the effects are zero, but uh, I would like approach it with caution. Um, yeah. Um, Dalton has a paper that uses um, misclassified twins. Um, looks at misclassified twins to sort of test the equal environment assumption. So I'm not sure he's thinking about the equal environment assumption the way we are. It's, um, so, but I think the basic idea is that if the misclassification is as good as random, then maybe the m misclassified twins. You know, MZ twins misclassified as DC should be more dissimilar than you would expect. And he doesn't find that, but you know, he'd be the first to tell you that it's, you know, there were sample size issues. Yeah. What if it turns out that identical twins is identical twins are? Yeah, that's a very good point. Yeah, and I mean, I mean, and so there's no question, right, that identical twins interact more than monozygotic twins, and it's unsurprising if you think about it. Um, and I think that's a bias. I mean, because uh, you would, um, like, the question is, like, absent the twin, would they, have, um, um, would they have developed in exactly the same way? And surely the answer is no, like, it would have been different. Again, it's a little, like, it's a little, it's not clear to me, like, it's not, it's not clear to me on what basis one would argue that this is a massive problem for two reasons. But again, like, the twin researchers should speak up, because you probably know more about this than I do. The first is, I think in a lot of models of like reciprocal influences, I think the prediction is you would see the effects on the variance, right? So you should see if they're influencing each other, it should, like it should um, in principle be detectable. And I don't know what the evidence in all this, on this is. I don't think that, I don't think we have any, um, uh, I don't think that most studies on this subject find like, like any evidence of dramatically important interactions. Um, and then again, the, the, the twins read apart, kind of, you know, sure, sometimes, in some cases, they're not literally read apart, and there were some interactions, but, but, um, mm, but you don't, but if this was a major factor, like, why is it that even people who grew up not knowing that they had a twin turn out to be so, so similar? So that's not to, like, discard this as completely irrelevant, but I, but I think, like, the most likely, like my, my reading of the evidence is it's unlikely to be a big deal. Um, well, yeah, James. Oh, one more thing. Um, like you'd also do things like look at the correlation between frequency of contact and similarity, and it's not very strong, but I don't know what that tells you exactly. Yeah. So, the study of twins read apart. So I'm not sure. Which is fixed to be in the problem. Any insights that can be gained from looking at the triplets? Mm. <laughs> well, quadruplets. You get a lot more observation, you get a lot more pairings, so you get more data. I don't know. What can you learn? Um, As opposed to this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a good question. <laughs> um, yeah, nothing immediately comes to mind. <laughs> Any thoughts? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, it's uh, like a lot of twin registries are, are technically multiple birth registries, so the triplets are in there, but I have never heard of anybody actually using them for something major. Yeah. Uh, okay, good. Excellent. Yeah, what's. Yes. So if MG twins are more similar to MZ twins, Um, yeah, the way I think about it, the answer is no. The way I think about it, if, um, you know, if, um, um, if, um, if you have a genotype that causes people to treat you in a certain way or causes you to seek out certain environments and then those things have downstream effects on your, you know, your occupational choice or something like that, I think of that as part of the genotype. 
Um, and, and so that, and, and because monozygotic twins are more similar, they're going to be more similar in terms of the environments they evoke and the environments they seek out. And so unless they're doing that precisely because they're, you know, because they are monozygotic twins, um, I don't think it was a violation. Um, Yeah, no, I don't think it's, um, I mean, I, I think there's a lot of uncertainty <laughs> about just how unreasonable it is, but it is unreasonable. It could be quantitatively quite important. So when we said that a lot of genetic variance is additive, that the additive variance is often large relative to the dominance variance, you know, we in no way meant to imply that it's, that the ratio is almost one, yeah. Um, well, because yeah. yesterday we had a statement about yeah. cliche. Yeah, so I did. I mean, I went and looked up the, um, the, the there's a there's that Queensland paper. I think I said that the typical estimates were about two percent, and and the abstract says the average was three percent across all the phenotypes they looked at, around twenty, give or take. Um, so I don't know if that um, like I don't know how they dealt with um, floor problems. Like if so, it could be that three percent is still an overestimate. I don't think. So that, that's dominance, and for epistasis, I really don't know what to believe. Um, some people, um, yeah, so I just think that there's a lot of uncertainty about just how wrong this assumption is. But if anyone has, you know, please speak up if you have insights. Um, okay. Okay, so, so if we make these assumptions, and, if we're like, and these assumptions are the distribution of U's and G's and twins are the same, then we get these um, moment conditions. So this is an alternative way of writing the ACE model. Um, and, um, um, and if you mess around a bit with two of these equations, you'll find that they imply that twice the difference in the population coloration is equal to narrow heritability. Assuming, of course, that our assumptions are correct. <laughs> so this is a very important um, point that sometimes I think um, um, sometimes a source of confusion. If the assumptions we make are bad, <laughs> you know, our estimates are going to be biased and potentially wildly misleading. And, and the purpose of the problem set question is to sort of uh, hammer, that, um, hammer that in. Um, okay, so, and so, so, so this is how you would write the ACE model under the assumptions we, under the assumptions we made. And the reason I, the reason, um, I point out that these um, moment conditions imply that twice the difference in correlation should be equal to narrow heritability, is that this formula will be familiar to many of you as the double, double the difference estimator or Falconer's formula. So the sample analog of this, so if we calculate twice the difference in the sample correlations, um, the resulting number is like is the Falconer estimate of, of heritability. And, um, and ultimately, uh, these days, people use fancier um, methods to get these estimates. But I think um, 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 like the, main, uh, main, the, main, the main potential advantage of these other methods is that they, they deal in a kind of reasonable way with inequality constraints. So variance components can't be negative, right? So that's kind of handled routinely by the, um, the maximum likelihood routines but that modern software is used. But fundamentally, <laughs> If this condition is violated, the maximum likelihood routines, whatever method you're using, is going to give you a biased estimate. Like at the at the core, this assumption still um, this assumption is still at the core of um, of any twin study. Um, and if it uh, if it's not approximately valid, you're going to get misleading answers with high probability. Okay. Okay. So now, oh, something briefly on the on the ACE parameterization. So just to point out. Additive genetic component, you can call it H2A. So some of you will be used to thinking of that as A squared. Um, the common environmental component, many of you will think of as C squared. And the unshared environment is just like this residual um, that, you can, that you get by backing out the, um, removing the, like basically the, all the variation that remains when you get rid of the um, uh, additive genetic effects on the common environment. Um, so this is. Perfect. You can like 
just transform the parameters from the way we wrote down the model to the way you're seeing it. And it's, it's exactly the same thing. It's just a different notation. OK. So now I want to go back. Um, how much time do I have? I'm not sure we have time for the adopsies. OK. So let me say something quickly just about these um, correlations now that we've talked a little bit about the, the ACE models. So here, here's, here are these um, sibling correlations that I showed you graphically before. Um, so I'm just showing them for height, years of schooling, and BMI. And the first observation that stands out is that when you restrict, so we're showing it for two, four, six, seven types of siblings who vary both in terms of whether they were raised together or apart. And um, they also vary in terms of their like genetic relatedness. So the first thing that, of, oh, and I should say here, the so underlying samples are enormous. So like standard errors aren't really an issue even for the adoptees. I mean, so the first thing that stands out is that um, um, when you compare, when, when you restrict the comparison to pairs of siblings raised in the same home, um, what you see is that there's like a decay, decay in resemblance as we, um, um, as the like genetic relatedness goes down, and for these traits, it's it's not dramatically different from the rate of decay you would predict from the additive model. Maybe it's a little bit too fast for BMI, um, but not. But you know, I think it's a I think it's a decent match even for, for BMI, and that's. Um, I, you know, I point that out because yesterday there were these questions like, how do we know that dominance variance is probably not that big a deal? Well, if it were a big deal, the prediction is um, a faster rate of decay. Okay? Now, of course, we can't be confident. You know, we can't say definitively that um, um, that's not the only way to interpret the data. Right? It could also be that the environmental correlations decay at a rate that's sort of proportional to, these, to the genetic relatedness. Um, um, and so, you know, in order to make inferences about dominance, we have to make some sort of uh, you know, assumption about the extent to which people raised in the same household share their environment. So in principle, right, you could extend the twin study to um, you could throw in full sibs rear together and half sibs rear together. And conceptually, you can do the same thing, like difference out the, the shared environment. But it's possible that you're making slightly stronger assumptions because, as somebody pointed out, um, in the case of non-twin siblings, you know, typically they're going to be two or three years apart uh, in age, and so maybe they share slightly um, uh, fewer um, of these like environmental results. So that's observation number one. Observation number two is that even if you look at siblings who are reared in separate homes, um, there's still a substantial um, correlation in their outcomes, both for half sibs and full sibs. Um, and the last observation, uh, okay, and uh, yeah, the last observation I'll make is that if you look at adopted kids, um, there. So if you take two genetically unrelated siblings reared in the same home, um, reared in the same household, there is a substantial similarity, I'd say, in educational attainment, and that's something to keep in mind when you listen to Alex Young's lecture, but not for things like height or BMI, and that's a very, very robust finding. And it's, it speaks a little bit to this possibility, right, that, there's, that selective placement is inducing substantial genetic correlation between these uh, you know, conventionally unrelated uh, siblings. Um, at least it doesn't appear to be the case that their height or their, um, or their BMI genes are strongly correlated. Okay? So it would be a very particular type of a selective placement that you'd have to worry about. Okay, and this I'm going to skip, I think. All right, so some canonical findings. Um, I, I mentioned Turkheimer's three laws yesterday. So Turkheimer, um, in fact, the, the, and the numbers that we look, just looked at are, are, are perfectly consistent with Turkheimer's three laws. He published a famous paper that suggested that there are these three principles that can organize a lot of behavioral genetic evidence. Principle number one, or finding number one, most traits are heritable. The second one is um, C square, so the, the proportion of variance due to these environmental effects that siblings share when they're raised in the same hold, is, home is smaller than E squared. Um, and third, a substantial proportion of um, variance in complex human behavioral traits is not accounted for by either genes or families. So like, in other words, even, even monozootic twins are, um, you know, are far from identical, with very few exceptions, are far from like, 
are anywhere close to identical on, on a lot of traits. So there's still, you know, there's some sort of forces on mis forces we don't understand that produce some dissimilarity between them. Um, okay. And here's that a massive Polderman paper that just went through more or less every published twin study ever and um, summarized um, the evidence. And really, this is just a, uh, you know, a validation of, um, <laughs> of Turkheimer's three laws. The way you see that is the red bars here are the um, monozygotic correlations. And they're consistently, for every single phenotype um, that I can see, they're consistently higher than the, than the um, um, DZ correlation. So that's it. It was like an impressive um, data gathering effort. OK, so in the last five minutes, I want to talk about adoption studies, because I think that they are sort of a nice um, um, they are a really nice research design for, for, um, for telling, teaching us about um, um, which environments really matter for, for, like for children's outcomes. And so we, we talked a little bit yesterday when we talked about why should we care about heritability, we talked about one, one issue is the you know, potential for genetic confounding. And one way to try to get at that is to look at children who are not biologically related to their, to their parents. Um, so, so I'll talk about this very nice paper by Sacerdote in the QG. Sacerdote, in turn, credits, you know, um, and I think his thinking is very much influenced by the sociologist Sandra Scar, who wrote a bunch of famous adoption studies in the 70s and 80s. Sacerdote um, is based on a larger sample and more recent, and so I'll, I'll, um, I'll, I'll go, go over uh, his paper. But there are many other um, studies out there that are worth looking at. Okay, so uh, I... So what's the basic idea? The basic idea is that you know, adoption is really this massive environmental intervention that um, creates a lot of independent variation in the conditions under which you're raised. And so um, it would be surprising if we didn't see that it had some impact on people's outcomes. But really what we want to know is like, what are the factors that, um, what features of the family environment are, you know, seem to matter for children's outcomes? Um, okay, so one, the most common problem with adoption studies is that we is that they typically need to assume random assignment, even though it's um, rarely um, likely to hold exactly. There's some exceptions, like in the Scandinavian countries, what you can do is often you can observe the biological parents' characteristics and control for them. And so that you know, if you worry if and, and if you worry that there might be some non-random assignment, it may be that a very decent way to adjust for it to get rid of most of the biases is to control for as many parental characteristics as you can. And if you observe everything about the parents that the adoption agency observed, then maybe you can argue that the remaining variation is plausibly you know, something um, exogenous. OK, what's nice about Sasser's paper is that the adoptees in his data appear to have been assigned to families using a process, process plausibly random. So he can, um, there was some non-randomness, but he can condition on that. So particularly people have the right to indicate a sort of gender preference. but that's observed in the data, so you just control for it. And he has a reasonably large sample of like 1,700 adoptees. So with the exception of the Scandinavian studies, I don't think there are many adoption studies of that um, magnitude. So he does three analyses. He does an ACE decomposition based on comparing the correlations of biological siblings raised in the same family to like adoptee sibling correlations. So the correlations between siblings who are not genetically related but reared in the same home. He also estimates parent-child transmission coefficients, both for biological and adopted children. So in other words, what's the correlation between mother's years of schooling and her child's years of schooling? And does it depend on whether she's genetically related to the child? And then um, what I like the most is that he kind of, he, he, he tries to um, uh, go beyond these kind of variance decompositions that are sensitive, I think, to the Goldberg critique, um, to sort of reporting estimates that can be interpreted more in, um, in the sort of treatment effect framework that that uh, economists are used to thinking about. So in particular, he defines three types of families. You know, small families where both parents completed college, that's type one. Large families in which neither parent completed college, that's type three. And then every other family is, is um, type two. And what's the benefit of that? Well, you can think of the type of family that you're assigned to. Under his identifying assumptions, you're sort of randomly assigned to a type of family. So we can estimate, we can talk about the treatment effects of being assigned to a type one family as opposed to a type two family. Um, and if we see that there is a treatment effect, it, it, 
I think we're making some progress towards identifying specific features of the environment that matter. Of course, we don't know for sure that what matters is having a small family or a family where people completed college. It could be that it's something correlated with those things. But I think we're making some progress in terms of moving away from this latent variable C that is sort of hard to interpret and we don't know exactly what goes into it. And these sorts of analysis sort of tell us more about what, what it is that we should um, look at. And the results are quite interesting. Okay, so here's the ACE decomposition. This is relatively straightforward. You sort of consistently find biological sibling correlations that are substantially higher. And if you do the sort of, you can do the ACE decomposition with these data, even though there are no twins. Um, it's just a different set of moment conditions. But I want to show you, I just have three more slides and then we're done. What I want to show you is first the um, transmission coefficient. So these are in, so the point about this figure is not the difference in levels, but the slope. Okay? So virtually every you know, developmental outcome you look at, you, what you see is that there is a strong relationship with income. Um, and among non-adoptees, so non-adoptees are like biological children of the adoptive parents who were raised uh, alongside the ad ad adoptees. And there you see that if, you, if, you're, if you're reared by your biological parents, um, your parental income is a strong predictor of your, um, um, of your family income as an adult. So this is a gradient. Uh, whereas for the adoptees, it looks pretty flat. So like growing up in a, being assigned to a high income family, there's no obviously discernible effect on your earnings as an adult. For education, it's a little bit different. There's, like there are at least hints of a, of a gradient and sort of the regression adjusted estimates, I think, bear suggests that this is something real. Um, of course, it's not as strong as the adoptees. So again, we should be wary, in both cases, the lesson is we should be wary of interpreting, like we should, it's legitimate to worry about genetic confounding in, when you estimate these transmission coefficients. But for adoptees, there appears to be something real there. So being assigned to a family where, the, where your parents went to college um, really does make a difference in terms of your likelihood of going to college. Um, I think it's an interesting observation that for whatever reason, whatever it is about the family environment that matters seems to be more correlated with parental education than parental income. And so the very last thing I'll show you, and then I'll shut up, are these treatment effect estimates. Um, so let me just illustrate with numbers in um, one of the columns. So I think this, um, so this compares, um, yeah, this compares type one to type three. And so what it says is, like under the assumptions, like under the identifying assumptions, the first coefficient estimate says that the effect of being assigned to a type three, type one family as opposed to type three is on average 7, 0.75 um, years of education. The effect on your likelihood of attending college is 16 percentage points more likely to attend college. Um, and you know, there's no statistically discernible effect on income, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, um, yeah, um, and so the point about these estimates is that they sort of answer, they begin to answer the Goldberger critique because they are really, they really are, in, um, they really are measures of, in some sense, effectiveness. They're not an R squared. They're telling you this is the effect of going from this environment to that environment, and th that's, those are the kinds of um, um, parameters that Goldberger advocated. Um, so I'll, I'll make one final remark, which is that all of these things are very interesting. But it is a very legitimate like, worry about the adoption studies that the, um, you know, that the results might not generalize because of different, because of these range restrictions and all these other potential problems. Um, and so now that molecular genetic data are becoming available, again, there are kind of real opportunities to do this sort of work, <laughs> but just controlling directly for the, uh, for the genotypes. And I think that's an interesting, very interesting um, uh, area of study. And if, you know, if anyone is pursuing work in that direction, I'm very interested in talking to you about it. That's it for me. Sorry if I ran over. <laughs>